Hello, everyone. My name is Rochelle Innocent, and I'm the founder and CEO of Project Purpose. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Our community is focused on fostering the intellectual and character development in children. We do this through our parent-child workshops that focus on four themes, autonomy, self-efficacy, compassion, and self-concept in order to cultivate grit, perseverance, and resilience in each child. At Project Purpose, our overarching mandate is to renew and rebuild family, communities, and relationships. Our YouTube platform provides us with an opportunity to have discussions on all topics that relate to family, community, and relationships with ourselves as well as with others, with a primary focus on mental health and education. More precisely, the ways that the institutions of mental health and education have played a role and currently play a role in our societies at large. These discussions and debates provide us with an opportunity to think critically about what needs to change within these structures in order for us to live up to our bold slogan, support, protect, and empower each child through youth-focused development, better known as leadership in juvenescence. We recognize that in valuing our children's leadership potential, that also translates as recreating and co-creating environments in order for our children to thrive. For those of you who are particularly keen, we also write thought pieces on our website. We drop those every other Sunday and we have one scheduled to drop this upcoming Sunday. I've included a link under my finger, so definitely be sure to check that out once you're done watching this video. Now, <clears throat> as is the YouTube convention, definitely subscribe. Join the community, you don't wanna miss out, and make sure you hit that post notification bell so that you're aware of every time we post. And of course, if you like our content and you wanna have these conversations continue, definitely be sure to like, comment, and share this video. Let's get into it. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome and welcome back for those of you who are returning to our channel. For those of you who are new on this channel, we cover topics that relate to mental wellness, mental health and education, and we're looking to make change. So we're here a couple of game changers hoping to have deep conversations that ignite the change that will hopefully make the systems that sort of revolve around mental wellness, mental health and education better and better equipped to support the people that they are built to serve. Um, so this week is a continuation of our conversation that we had on education. Just a quick recap. I had a few videos the last few weeks that we covered education that really addressed my specific pain points with the juxtaposition between mental health and education. I, in one of those videos, made some pretty strong and bold statements about educators and their role around education, um, which later involved a lot of really great and animated discussion that had me recognize that while definitely it's, it's a place where we need to look and there's a place where we can probably provide uh, opportunities for growth and development, it's still premature to make any bold accusations. So. In that spirit, this video is a bit of a continuation. So I think what I might do is I might do a series of drop-ins. So I made a very bold statement. I subsequently apologized for said bold statement. And in this video, I'm addressing the areas that are really the cause of why I needed to take a step back and reflect and recognizing the blind spots that I have within the arena of education and I think what I'd like this video to be is going to be a very different tone. I'm taking on a, di a very different role rather than me come to you in this video as an expert providing you with the resources that I've been exposed to that have informed my way of thinking on things. This video is me sort of being open and honest about what I've discovered through the progress of, of these videos and the conversations that have generated as a byproduct of these videos. Um, the blind spots that I've recognized that I have in, in, in this area and I'd like this to be considered an open invitation to fill those blind spots out with your knowledge, with your information. So definitely this is me taking on more of a learner's hat and just being genuinely curious about the areas that I don't know a whole lot about by way of education and how things work on the ground. I think before jumping into the video, I'm gonna quickly do an insert, an insert of the comment that I made, um, an insert of the apology that followed, and then what I'm going to do is follow up with, uh, let's do a deeper dive on the specific blind spots. Let's get into it. 
because too many children who are normal, who might be a deviation from the majority, but still their disposition has been has been constant um, and who are getting misdiagnosed with, with mental health issues. So observer, rel observer relative biases are, are things that we need to completely nip in the bud and we need to also recognize who vo whose voices we shut down. And I'm all about like, making sure your voice is heard and making sure that you get your voice out there. But if that voice is telling you that you need to medicate your otherwise healthy child because your child makes it hard for someone to do their job, then that voice needs to get shut down very quickly. All right, so now that you've seen the clip, I, I definitely wanted to take this opportunity to apologize for the message, for the tone, as well as for the delivery. Um, I definitely meant it when I said it. I, I felt that I was speaking from a place of conviction and I was speaking from a place of really being a child advocate. <laughs> All to say, that doesn't give me any permission, any pass to disparage an entire group of individuals. Okay, so by now you've seen the bold comments, you've seen the apology, let's jump into the blind spots. So one thing that I know for sure is my knowledge is fueled by research papers, dissertations, um, journal articles, different blog posts potentially, surveys, polls, different studies, whether they're federal government studies or whether they're private studies, a lot of pretty much 95% of the information that I relate to you is, is, is from formalized documentation on the topic of education, on the politics around education, on the evolution history of education. My biggest blind spot is, um, it would be the blind spot of anyone who is sort of trying to investigate and, and get a sense of the system on the outside, but doesn't have any real sense of the functioning of the operational aspect of that system from the inside. Um, so that was part of some of what came out of these different conversations is, is, is to talk about the bureaucracy behind education, right? And how that bureaucracy has evolved and kind of evolved in a way where it's obscure. We don't know how much of what takes place in the classroom is really influenced and held into place by administrators or by even those who manage the administration team. So this is a video to dig deeper into the culture of education from the viewpoint of the educator who maybe potentially was thinking that being an educator was being a change agent but then recognized that they were very much that their role was very much already predefined and there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room there. So I guess that's my first question. My first question is how much actual authority and autonomy does a teacher have within a classroom when it comes to the decisions that they make around how they choose to manage that classroom? And, and, and that's not just when we're talking about disruptive behavior, just manage the classroom in general. How much of that is prescribed by those above them? Um, another question is, how much bureaucracy is involved with, with wanting to change things in a classroom, or even if that's something really, really small? Like, is there a lot of steps to follow? Is, is there just a lot of unwritten rules, essentially, as well? Like, what are the punitive effects of, of stepping out and speaking up about aspects of the system that you as educators aren't in accordance with. And this doesn't have to be the things that I disagree with. I mean, it could be anything. Like my issue is definitely the pipeline of drug interventions that starts within a classroom. But I'm sure that there are other issues that stem from the classroom environment that you as educators would be more suited to speak to um, and maybe have spoken to and have recognized that there's an unwritten rule or several unwritten rules around speaking up around those given topics and there might be ramifications as a result of you know not following or coinciding with those rules and regulations so I'd love to get a sense of that because one thing that I've recognized is I had this assumption that educators had a lot of say around how they manage their class and how they choose to handle different students. And I've spoken with uh, actually this one individual that I spoke with, she works within the government, um, sort of social work um, and, and works with, with underprivileged youth or with, with troubled youth. And she talked a lot about how there's just a lot of, there's a lot that people on the ground aren't unable to do. There's a lot of red tape. 
And red tape is something that even impacts the private sector. And we recognize that in order for positive change to take place, we need to remove the layers of bureaucracy. And I know, just like on a whim, that the public system has way more bureaucracy that it has to kind of manage through than the private sector. So I'd love to know how much more. And anecdotally, because I know that I can find this out by reading a research paper, of course. I mean, that's my favorite go-to. But I think my biggest blind spot is the fact that I don't have anecdotal knowledge. And I think I was hoping to gain that from discussions and debates. But I think rather than blindly do a call to action to have different discussions and debates, I think I need to be more specific about what it is that I'm looking to know, about what I'm curious to know. And I'm curious to know, to what extent do you feel your hands are tied as an educator by way of properly helping a child? And when I say properly helping a child or properly offering support, um, offering support the way that you think would best suit that child's needs and then recognizing that you've run up against the wall. I wanna know if there are walls and if there are walls, I'd like to get a sense of what those walls are. Um, and I'd also like to get a sense of what are the ramifications written or otherwise political, um, what have you, of ignoring the wall and trying to make a difference anyway. I'd love to get a sense of what that would look like. And I guess I'm more speaking about the cost of speaking up. Like, is it a career limiting move to speak up or speak up? up against the system? What are the implications of speaking up or of taking issue with certain practices that are in place and trying to bring reform and evolve some of those practices within your specific environment? I would also like to get a sense of what those drug intervention pipelines look like within your specific school, within your specific school administration, within your specific district. Um, and, and, and what about those practices, you know, are outdated by your viewpoint or you feel, you know, with a little bit of tweaking might be better. How disruptive behavior gets addressed specifically within your school and what you feel are the pros and cons with how it's addressed in your school specifically. And I, I get some of this information anecdotally from parents, but I'd love to see it from a teacher's point of view. At what point um, if it is the case that you take issue with some of the ways that, you know, disruptive students get managed within your school, um, I'd love to get a sense of why. I'd love to get a sense of how those cases are managed. I'd love to get a sense of how broadly accepted those practices are um, and how many children have sort of get, got swept into that pipeline as a byproduct of no one really taking a magnifying glass and looking at it. Um, and then how many teachers kind of look away because too many of those who chose not to look away were penalized as a result of it. So I think that that's a big blind spot that I wanted to address. I want to get a sense of the bureaucracy, the mechanisms behind that bureaucracy, the, the, pol the policy and processes, the governance around that bureaucracy, because these are internal documents. These are not documents that typically one like me, who's not part of the system, would have access to or can get a hold of. Um, in the interim, while I wait on your responses and on your engagement, I'll be doing my own research and seeing, you know, what at a federal, provincial, regional level policies and procedures exist that might um, inform some of the practices that take place within schools and I'll also be providing that information to you. And what I'll try to do is I'll read these documents and infer practices from what it is that I read. So just kind of infer how that might translate in a schooling system and I'd allow you, those of you who are part of that system, to correct me if I am off base. So this is the way that I'd like to kind of start having conversations around education. I, I want to be much more mindful about the inclusive aspect of that conversation and I think that all players, regardless of where they are on that field or what role they have played, have an opportunity to be a change agent, to be a hashtag game changer, because I think that in order for this to really work, all of us need to have a voice. Um, and, and that's a change in attitude that I've had over the last month and a half or so. Um, I think that the more inclusive we can make this movement, the more probability that we have that it'll actually turn into something. But it was really important that in this video, I took off my expert hat and I put on my learner's hat and I showed you that I'm here willing to learn, right? I'm not here with all the answers. I'm not here doggedly going after an objective and being very dogmatic about the way that I look at it. I'm happy to evolve my view on the given topic. I mean, I'm not going to change my general position on 
drug interventions in, in, in young children, but I, I'm happy to have that position colored by more information so that I don't see it from the perspective um, that is strictly based on like the research that I've been exposed to. I'd love to get a sense of how it translates anecdotally, how it translates from an educator's perspective, from an administration's perspective. I know a lot about this information from a neuroscience, from the science, from the research. Um, so I guess from my mental health psychological point of view, um, I've read a lot about it by way of, you know, um, counter pharma research studies. So studies that kind of build around some of what is put out into the market by pharmaceutical companies that create a general sense of um, ease when it comes of ease when it comes to prescription medication and how they try to kind of break through that ease with with real information that shows like the real demarcation of the landscape so i think that we can formalize the landscape in written prose and make it look a certain way but i think that we can color that perspective and build it out and give it dimension by hearing from the very specific experiences that we have from people who've worked in the field for probably the majority of their career if not their entire career. Um, so that was the gist of this specific video. Um, I wanted to ask my different questions. I wanted to kind of make it open. I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to give their perspective, give their point of view. And I know that it's a bit of a sensitive topic, especially if I'm asking for you to let me know, like, you know, what practices you don't agree with. And if there are really bad ramifications as a result of it, then I do definitely invite you to continue on sending me emails and letting me know and then I anonymously of course will share that back with with my audience because I think we we all need to understand why certain levers function the way that they, they do in order to build a, a counter position that is that is thorough that is thoroughly thought through and that takes into consideration potential blind spots because we definitely know don't want to advance um, and create change not seeing the full picture. So I guess this is me backpedaling, looking to get a sense of, looking to get a better sense of the full picture because I am deeply, deeply motivated to see this change translate in my lifetime. And I think that if that means that sometimes I, I push forward and other times I take a couple steps back, then I'm willing to do that song and dance for you. So I really do hope that you enjoy the content of this conversation. I don't believe that this video is going to be very long, but I did want to make sure that I address my blind spots um, because I do want you to recognize that if I am ever apologizing again on this platform, it is a genuine apology always. Um, and I do know that, you know, it is from a genuine place and what follows an apology from me is, is changed behavior. So this video is hopefully for you a demonstration of that change behavior of me trying to really rethink my approach so that I can ensure that I am true to my own words and to my own commitment and creating an environment where everyone's words and everyone's knowledge and everyone's point of view can be taken into consideration as we build towards a better tomorrow together. So thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate our conversations. I love chatting with you. Definitely get more into chatting in the comments. I mean, the comments in, on YouTube are fairly blank. I mean, I do get some comments here and there, but like most of the interactions are happening in Facebook groups, which is great too. I mean, I love the engagement in Facebook, but I would also love to have a lot of engagement here. I would love to fuse all of that wonderful information in one place and on this platform and it would be so wonderful if we could do that all together. So yeah, if you've made it to the end of this video, definitely be sure to subscribe to the channel, like, comment, and share this video. Send me a note. I've also included in the description access to all of my social media platforms. Make sure you give those a share as well. Um, and I will be planning a 1K giveaway. So if you think that, you know, I'm not about that life, I definitely am. So really pushing to get to 1,000 subscribers. Uh, I think my initial goal is 1,000 subscribers by the end of March, but I had to move that out. I mean, I'm not really quite sure how quickly this goes, but um, I'm feeling the momentum and I'm super, super excited. So for those of you who have subscribed, thank you so much. Please get those that you know to subscribe as well. Let's share this message. Let's give it life or let's continue to breathe life into it. I'm so excited for what's taking place even now. The momentum is really building. 
um, and I'm looking forward to continuing on engaging with you. So all of that to say, thank you so much for tuning in and talk soon. <laughs>